Hello, I'm Jason Howland, and welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. You know, summer is here. The grass is green, the trees are full of leaves, and the flowers have bloomed. And with all of that comes pollen, which causes a lot of people problems. Here to talk more about allergies is Dr. Kunal Shah. She is a board-certified allergist from Mayo Clinic Health System. Dr. Shah, thanks for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thanks. Happy to be here. Well, seasonal allergies are just what the, the name implies, allergies associated with the seasons. So first of all, what are the different kinds of seasonal allergies and what causes allergies? So allergies are our body's reaction to something they perceive as foreign, such as pollen or mold spores. And what happens is our body makes these antibodies to fight the allergen, causing the inflammatory response and the symptoms of allergy. The things that bother us if you have seasonal allergies in the early spring are trees, um, late spring, early summer, grasses, and then late summer and fall till the frost would be weeds. Mold spores are really high early spring and all of fall. Talked about uh, tree pollen in the spring. Are there certain trees that more people are allergic to? Some trees tend to cause more symptoms. Oak, birch are kind of the highest alder tree as well. Um, around here, I see a lot of patients who have issues with cottonwood tree. And then how about weeds? I know ragweed is a big issue, right? That's the number one allergen. Most of the people who come in to see us often have ragweed as one of the ones on their list. Uh, well, with the warm winter and the very nice spring that we've had here in the Midwest, does that make allergies more prevalent in the air and does it also make them more severe or not? Definitely. The weather has been great, but what it means for the plants and the grasses and the weeds is that they are not used to this, so what the pollination pattern for them is changing. They're starting to pollinate earlier, they're continuing to pollinate later in their season, and actually they're evolving um, between the weather as well as the climate and the air pollution, they're evolving to become more allergenic. So the outer layer of the pollen is becoming stronger and more allergenic, causing more severe symptoms. Patients with allergies are now fighting super pollens? Exactly. Wow. Uh, so what are your general symptoms? If you have allergies, uh, seasonal allergies, what are your symptoms? Your symptoms would be depending on where the pollen hits you. So if it's touching your eyes, um, itchy watery eyes, red eyes, sometimes some swelling around the eyes. Um, if you inhale it and it gets into your nose and your lungs, you'll get runny nose, congestion, uh, post-nasal drip, and then in your lungs it causes asthma-like symptoms, chronic cough or wheezing. And if you touch the pollens, um, or if you sit in the grass and you're allergic to pollen, you can get either a simple rash or if you're prone to eczema, it will flare the eczema. So how does someone know if uh, or what they are allergic to and, and when should they come in to see an allergist like yourself and get tested? That's a great question. Um, patients who have symptoms that are bothersome uh, every day, they interfere with their daily life or not responding to medications should come see an allergist because we can test them via blood or skin testing to help the, guide them as to what season they might need medicine in. Um, also patients who have chronic asthma, recurrent attacks of asthma, or recurrent sinusitis, recurrent ear infections, or multiple upper respiratory infections often have allergies that predispose them, so they should come in as well. And, and what sort of testing do you do to test people? We can do a blood or a skin test. Um, the blood test it is what it is. You take some blood and, and it gets sent off and we get a result about a week later. The skin test um, is nice because you get your result the same day. We prick your skin either on your arm or your back with little plastic prickers. They, they, don't, they barely break the skin and the pollen extracts are placed there. And within 15 minutes if you develop um, like a mosquito bite, we call it a wheel and flare reaction, those are what you're allergic to. So it's pretty straightforward then. Very straightforward. Uh, so what are your options then? Uh, if, if I've gone in, had a skin test done, you've, uh, you've figured out there's three or four things that I am allergic to, what are my options? So your options include over-the-counter pills, um, nose sprays, um, or allergy shots. The over-the-counter pills and nose sprays and eye drops that we use are usually antihistamines or sometimes steroids for the nose. 
as well as steroid pills that we can use. We also use two other classes of medication. One is a leukotriene modifier. It just hits the allergies in another mechanism and the allergy shots as I had mentioned. You mentioned over-the-counter medications. There are lots and lots of over-the-counter medications that that help people with allergies. Um, is, is it a case of should patients sort of find which one works best for them and, and if nothing works then maybe uh, go to prescription? Sure. Um, the over-the-counter medications work great. Most of them were prescription a few years ago and have come over-the-counter. Um, what we can help with as allergists is directing you as to when your season's going to start so you can get started on the medication before you hit the pollen season. Otherwise, it's often too late and some inflammation is already developed, so we're reversing, we're trying to backpedal to fix it. Dr. Shaw, what about alternative medicines? I've heard uh, a little bit about that with, in, in helping people with allergies. Sure. Um, alternative and complementary medicine is a very big area of research in the allergy world right now. The one consistent place that they've seen benefit is vitamin D. It helps with allergies and asthma symptoms as well as helping prevent asthma in certain patients if their vitamin D level was low to begin with. There's similar studies showing benefit with vitamin E and extra vitamin A as well. There are some herbs like buttleburr and stinging nettle that have, have helped alleviate some allergy and asthma symptoms. However, with the herbal medications, there's an increased risk of drug interactions. So you want to talk to your doctors. And the research hasn't shown us quite the right dosage yet for improving symptoms and minimizing side effects of drug interactions. So there's still some research left to be done. Okay. How about nasal rinses? I've heard about those. Do those work? Sure. Nasal rinses work very well if you use them correctly and consistently. You always want to use um, distilled water or filtered water. You want to use salt or a premix packet with salt or sodium chloride and bicarbonate. This helps wash off the mucus and the allergens from your nose. This allows you to have some symptom relief as well as if you're going to use nose sprays, the mucus is gone so the nose spray actually hits the tissue in your nose to, to work properly. And how often, if, if you're using a nasal rinse, how often should you use it? If you use a nasal rinse, I'd say at least once a day for maintenance. If you have increased symptoms, you could go as much as two times a day as well without causing any damage. Well, you know, uh, avoiding the allergens is probably your best bet when you have allergies, but that's not really possible around here uh, with seasonal allergies unless you stay in the house until winter, right? Exactly. And we don't want patients, especially children, to change the way they live. We want them to be outside and play. We would just like to offer some guidance on how to avoid allergens, such as keeping windows closed when you come in from playing outside or, or running outside or doing anything outside, change your clothes, wash your hands and face, or take a shower, because the pollens love to stick to our lashes, our hair, and if we fall asleep without changing, then we're going to be inhaling the pollen all night. So some of the other things that patients can do is keeping their windows closed in the car, not going outside just before a thunderstorm on a very windy day, or early in the morning when the pollen counts are at their highest. Why are the pollen counts uh, so high in the morning, thunderstorms, you talked about that. Why are they so high then? Well, with the thunderstorms and sometimes in the morning, it has to do with all the wind that's kicked up the pollen. But also um, plants and grasses especially pollinate first thing in the morning, which is why the counts are higher. And the humidity level also affects how much pollen stays airborne. So can you ever be cured of allergies? Will they ever just go away? Yeah, some patients are lucky enough that they outgrow their allergens, especially if they started to have symptoms in a very young age. But other patients use something like immunotherapy or allergy shots, and that's a way that we can desensitize you to what your body thinks is foreign. We give a series of injections, initially weekly over four to six months, and then monthly over four to six years. We start with what you're allergic to, such as ragweed, use it in a very small quantity and build up so as to get your body used to that allergen. And eventually, um, 80 to 90 percent of patients are either on less medicine, no medicine, and with less symptoms or no symptoms. And the results last beyond discontinuation of the shots. That's pretty amazing. 80 to 90 percent uh, seeing significant um, improvement. Mm -hmm. uh, why don't more people do the uh, injections? The, um, the flip side of the allergy shots is they come with a risk. There's a risk of a huge allergic reaction because we are injecting what you're allergic to. Um, it also requires us to have the patient stay in the office under our observation for 30 minutes. 
So in this day and age, it's very hard for people to come in every week and stay for 30 minutes. That's one of the main reasons patients aren't opting for shots. So it's a big time commitment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, are allergies mainly just a nuisance for folks, or can they ever be life-threatening? Like, you know, you hear about um, with food allergies, you know, it can be life-threatening, or someone uh, being stung by a bee, you know, it can be mm -hmm. life-threatening. Can, can seasonal allergies be life-threatening, too? Seasonal allergies can be life-threatening in a few ways. They can cause patients to have severe asthma attacks, which can lead to um, either a fatal reaction or a complication. They can also cause chronic sinusitis, which can lead to complications, including an infection around the brain. Um, anaphylaxis, like food allergies or venoms, is less common, but it is possible that multiple systems can have an allergic reaction at once, which is what anaphylaxis is. And that can happen with pollen as well. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, though, seasonal allergies is just mainly, it's a quality of life. It's, mm -hmm. If you have seasonal allergies, you're miserable certain times of the year, right? Exactly. And you're more prone to certain infections because mm -hmm. that inflammation sets you up for more colds or more asthma or more sinus infections. Well, at what age do you see most allergies start showing up in patients? Is it something that, that we're born with or can adults suddenly just start having allergies? Asthma and allergies as well as eczema all run together and they're very genetically based. So if it's in your family, odds are you're going to have it. Um, if you had one or the other as a child, such as asthma or eczema, odds are you're going to develop seasonal allergies. So the patients I see are usually toddlers and young children, but adults can develop allergies when they're older, especially if they've moved to a new environment or had an issue where their immune system was suppressed. Will you see it even in infants, or is it primarily like when in the toddler years or uh, young teenage years? It's primarily in the toddler and young children, like school-age children. Mm -hmm. However, we are seeing more and more infants, starting with asthma, that we're finding have an allergic component. And those are the same infants that often have eczema or the dry, itchy skin patches. And within two or three years, by the time they're two to four, they'll start to have more of the nose, the runny nose, the itchy, watery eyes all the allergic symptoms as well. Can children have, uh, can they go through the uh, allergy shots, the immuno immunotherapy? Yes, children can, and every allergist um, has a different cutoff for where they feel comfortable. For me, I like the children to be able to communicate with me to say if they're having a mild symptom after a shot, so as to reduce the risk, because then we can treat it sooner. Um, it's also a commitment, and we are injecting them weekly, so I want them to be old enough to be able to understand that. I usually start around five. Is it more beneficial to start uh, earlier in life with, with the shots? Definitely. If you do allergy shots as an adult, you'll have less um, symptoms or use less medicine. But as a child, it actually changes the way your immune system develops. So you won't be so prone to developing new allergens later in life. You know, Dr. Shah, uh, uh, I was diagnosed with uh, hay fever, seasonal allergies when I was a young child. And I went through the immunotherapy uh, as a young adult, uh, did the shots for, for five or six years, and was absolutely cured of uh, my ragweed uh, allergies, which were just awful at the time. Is, is there a chance with the environment changes that we have and the super pollens that you talked about, is there a chance that my allergies could come back? Unfortunately, there is a chance because they're doing a lot of research looking at the, the changes with the amount of diesel gas in the air, the changes with the ozone exposure, and grasses and ragweeds have actually been shown to change the outside covering, causing them to look a little different than they used to when you were desensitized. So there are some adults who had symptoms as a child and are now developing them again almost in the same seasons because it's just those little changes in the pollen that are causing them to have symptoms again. So uh, what I was building my uh, body's resistance up to has now changed, basically. Exactly. It's evolved. So Dr. Shah, uh, if a patient wants to see an allergist like yourself, can they just schedule an appointment with you or do they have to be referred uh, through their uh, family provider? Or how does that work? Most of the time they can just make the appointment. Um, there are a few insurance companies that prefer a referral and often that just requires you to call your primary to say, I want to see the allergist and they just put a little order through. Um, but most of the insurances that we have around here will allow you to make, the ref will allow you to make a self-referral, just come in on your own. All right, fantastic. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Shah, for joining us today on Speaking of Health, a great topic. Thank you. And that's all the time we have. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy.